Um, all right, so I'm Tim O'Shea uh, from Virginia Tech. Um, and uh, can I just see, how many of you guys saw uh, Charles Clancy's keynote on Tuesday? Okay, so uh, I'm gonna try my best to not repeat a lot of that. Um, but so th this is generally my research area, uh, and, and I'm very interested in you know, what we can do uh, with machine learning in the radio signal processing area. Um, and I'm gonna talk today um, less about the applications that Charles spoke about and a little bit more about um, kind of the resources and tools that are out there to help you get started uh, in that area and how GNU Radio has helped enable that. All right, so Spectrum is crowded. We all know that. The regulators are finally letting us do things that are a little bit more dynamic to pack things in a little closer together. Um, and so uh, really we, we want to have a, a better awareness in many of our radios and sensors of, of what's out there um, and uh, how to interoperate with, with radios uh, in a more effective way. And so if we look at you know, existing uh, automated classification systems, they're really very expert focused. Um, this has been the traditional way to do it, is deriving expert statistics like cumulants or various uh, moments, uh, and then building decision trees. Um, and if you look at kind of, you know, the whole history of cognitive radio over the past 10 years or so, um, we've really just had expert system after expert system after expert system. Um, and we really need to get away from this uh, if we want to have radios that can learn and generalize much better to new types of signals and environments and problems. Um, so they're not super specified by experts. Um, now, that whole idea is not unprecedented. So if you look at what's happened in uh, image recognition and speech recognition over the past 10 years, um, there's been a really major shift toward learned features. Um, so we used to use like um, Gabor filters in imagery uh, and various types of edge detectors and, and uh, line detectors, and these are all very expert features that were extracted from an image at the very beginning. Um, and if you look at you know, the current state of the art, it's completely feature learning based, so people don't use those features anymore. Uh, and so all the expertise that went into you know, building and maintaining and optimizing those sorts of features is really kind of irrelevant today. Um, and we have these end-to-end -end learning systems uh, that can learn uh, those features directly from data sets. Um, same thing in speech, so a lot of systems for a very long time have used the MEL frequency coefficients as kind of the, the baseline input to HMMs and various types of speech recognition systems. Uh, we don't really need that anymore. Uh, there's these end-to-end -end convolutional uh, front ends which can learn filter banks uh, naively from data sets which are starting to outperform the MEL frequency features. So really this is a, this is a wide trend in machine learning for different fields. And it hasn't really fully hit the radio and signal processing domain yet, um, but it's kind of inevitable that it will, in my mind. Um, and so I'm really trying to push that. And I think that you know, moving to feature learning and systems that generalize well uh, is gonna be a really big thing for enabling um, future cognitive radios. All right, so uh, just wanted to go over kind of a, a very brief list of you know, what is really new in neural nets uh, over the past 10 years that's given us all these advances. Uh, and there's a lot of different things that have gone into it, right? So beyond the, just the compute power of NVIDIA cards and the programming models that let us work on them easily, uh, there's been a lot of advances in how we do gradient descent methods. So there's a lot of these asynchronous methods that do momentum normalization that, that are uh, orders of magnitude more effective than traditional gradient descent methods. Um, regularization has been a big thing, so dropout regularization um, has really, really helped us train uh, it, uh, much more general and less overfit models uh, than we previously could. So one of the really cool things about dropout is you're, you're kind of training two to the n models in parallel uh, and uh, combining them um, in one network without, without having to do a um, kind of traditional ensemble method. Um, all right, so, all right. Um, so if we look at signal processing and radio in general, uh, you know, where can we apply this? And, and really, you know, if we think about our modems, they're typically a series of estimators for different offsets or channel variances, uh, followed by estimators for symbols, 
uh, and various transforms, so back and forth to frequency or you know, filtering, and, and really you know, any of these different classifiers or estimators or transforms is something that we could consider, you know, can, can a learned representation do better than some of the expert systems we have now, right? And we can, we can trade and compare and see how all these things work and, and how high the complexity is of these kind of approximated methods. Um, so I think that there's, there's kind of a wide open field uh, of kind of re-looking at everything we've done in signal processing uh, in the context of, well, what if we learn to do it or learn to approximate it instead? You know, how does that performance compare? Um, so, um, data sets are really uh, key to this whole field. Um, and if you look at imagery and speech, again, there's some really, really great data sets out there. Um, so, Kaggle.com obviously has tons of these competitions, and the center of any one competition is the data set, essentially. Uh, and you know, figuring out whatever task you're trying to do with that data set, um, but, but it all centers around the data set. Um, and in imagery, we have MNIST and ILVC and the Google Street View Challenge and speech, we have Timit, AN4, LDC. There's, there's dozens of different really well-maintained and labeled and curated data sets in these domains. Uh, and that's something we don't really have in the radio domain yet. Uh, people kind of tend to craft their own sorts of data sets, but we don't have these kind of general um, data sets that people work on and treat as their kind of base of, uh, you know, starting to work on an application and, and quantitatively measuring, you know, how well can I accomplish whatever application I'm trying to do with this data set. Um, so this is really what I'm trying to do here is start to build some data sets kind of for basic tasks in the comms domain and put them out there as kind of benchmarks so that people can uh, compare approaches and kind of be quantitative about, you know, how well different techniques perform. Um, all right, so Green Radio uh, obviously is extremely helpful when we start doing that. Um, and so uh, the data set that I've been using is just, it's a synthetic data set built entirely with Guinea Radio. Um, and uh, this, is, this has kind of been the basis for a lot of the work uh, that we've worked on. Um, and so modulation recognition is, you know, it's kind of a simple task, but it's one that we've done forever in comms, and so it's kind of a good benchmark task um, because people understand it quickly. And there's a lot of existing approaches that we can compare uh, to. Um, so um, if we look at kind of data set generation, um, what we're doing here is, is basically, you know, we start with uh, some source alphabet. Uh, and in this case, we have both discrete and continuous uh, signals uh, that we care about being modulated. Um, so um, for discrete, we're using text data. Uh, and this is just the Shakespeare corpus. Uh, and for continuous, we're using uh, a, a, a podcast episode here. Um, and so this is just kind of the source material uh, across all the modulations so that it's, it's uh, something standard to reference and that's open and easy to access. Um, so we can run that into a whole host of different modulators that just come in Guinea Radio um, and uh, go through all the PSKs and QAMs and FSKs and, and the AM modulations here. Uh, basically to, to generate our data set. Um, and so, obviously, we, we whiten uh, the text bits before we go into this, uh, go through the modulator, do standard pulse shaping, uh, and then interpolate up to, you know, n samples per symbol, which I think is on the order of uh, two in this data set. Um, all right, so then the channel model is a big deal, right? So we're making a synthetic data set, and we want it to be a stand-in for actually doing mod rec over the air. Um, and obviously there's no substitute ever for a real wireless channel. Um, so um, we are using a simulated channel, um, but so these are all tools that are, with, are in Guinea Radio uh, GR channels in the main Guinea Radio. Um, and so uh, I think I added these a couple years ago, and basically what we have here is uh, we have a sample rate offset model which simulates uh, basically sample clock drift uh, in your receiver. Um, so your sampling points are kind of drifting around because you're not locked to the sample time. Um, you have your CFO model, so your center frequency is drifting around in frequency, um, so you're not centered on your signal all the time. And you have a selective fading model, so this is doing uh, basically Rayleigh fading um, and uh, introducing kind of multipath and delay spread into your uh, signal. And then obviously we have our white Ga Gaussian noise um, that you would always have in a channel. So we're trying to make this a very, you know, a fair test where we actually kind of beat it up and give it 
all of the real channel effects you would see. Um, and then lastly, um, you know, we look at how do you slice this up, right? And so there's a lot of ways to do it. Um, at the end of the day, you have a bunch of these long runs of these synthetic data sets, or it's just big time series, right? And so here we're slicing it up into many little example looks at kind of random times uh, at each of those signals. Um, and then going through and normalizing kind of the mean and the variance of each example so that there's no bias left there. Um, you know, building this giant uh, uh, tensor of um, examples. So we have n examples by, you know, complex uh, two values uh, by, in this case, 128 uh, time samples uh, is kind of what we're using as our uh, baseline. Um, and we store this off to a pickle file so that it can be really easily loaded and pulled into machine learning tools um, that are out there. Uh, and so this is really kind of nice because, um, you know, in the um, uh, kind of data science community, people are used to being able to just kind of pull a data set into the machine learning tools and then not worry about kind of the source domain, right? So you can start playing with this without having to, you know, mess with getting radio or any actual real radio things, right? You can just kind of treat it as a data set. Um, all right, so uh, this is kind of what it looks like. So this is, you know, an examples in time and frequency. Um, and uh, we have here basically 11 different classes. Um, this is all available if you want to play with it on RadioML.com. Um, and the hope is that kind of as this matures, I'll do kind of periodic releases of, um, of the data set, uh, nominally along with the kind of Ubuntu release schedule. Um, and the hope is that these will grow in the realism of the channel model, in the uh, number of modulations, and in the complexity of the modulations. So for now, these are all kind of continuously modulated signals. Uh, but you could think that you would also want to worry about a lot of things like different bursts or uh, multi-access schemes or, uh, you know, wider band uh, issues uh, for sensing. Um, Right, so the hope is that people will, you know, if, they, if people would like to work with this, they'll use the actual generated data set that's available. Uh, and then, you know, if there's features and improvements to the data set, um, this can be folded into the kind of open source generation tools uh, to be snapshotted in kind of the next release of the data set. Um, that way everyone's kind of comparing to a common set of uh, data files here. All right, so, um, this was just kind of to give an example of a, of a kind of a traditional expert approach here. Um, and there really are papers out there and many people who, who uh, you know, derive these very expert decision trees uh, that go through and decide is it a linear modulation, uh, you know, is it constant modulus. And you go through all of these very specific statistical tests and you really, you come up with this kind of very expert decision tree uh, which has been tailored exactly to the modulations of interest. Uh, and this is really how it's been done for a long, long time. Um, so um, we, we approximate this uh, as our kind of baseline by looking at um, extracting each of, these, uh, each of these features separately and then basically in our case just training a, a naive decision tree based on data rather than some expertly defined set of statistical tests. Um, all right, so for the ConfNet approach, it's kind of completely different. Um, we're uh, pulling in our input data. Um, we're basically going through uh, two convolutional layers, uh, through two dense layers, and then out a softmax layer. Um, and in this case, you, you optimize using this categorical cross entropy uh, to kind of be your loss function. Um, there's a lot of parameters that you need to uh, kind of look over optimizing. Uh, and, um, you know, these are nominally hyperparameters that you, that you want to optimize to. Uh, get the best performance out of your network, um, looking at kind of filter sizes and pooling strategies um, and a number of different approaches. Um, so we had train here using Atom and RMS prop, which are just forms of stochastic gradient descent with momentum uh, that, um, that are kind of uh, some of the, I guess, state-of-the-art methods for now. Um, and, you know, looking at, at much deeper architectures, we haven't seen a huge advantage to going uh, you know, further for this task. Um, but so a lot of this stuff, uh, so Keras is a really great Python uh, machine learning library. Um, and uh, this is kind of one of the things we've used to build 
up these tools. Um, and, it, and it uses a back end of Theano and TensorFlow. And both of these are, you know, you can think of them as NumPy, where the algorithm gets then compiled down into a CUDA kernel uh, to run on your GPU. So um, it's, it's kind of like the programming efficiency of NumPy with the uh, execution of, you know, nearly uh, well-optimized uh, CUDA code on a GPU. All right, so we saw this before. I'm not going to belabor it, but we, you know, our performance is a couple dB better than um, what we can get with kind of the traditional expert features, um, and significantly lower in complexity um, and compute cost. Uh, so, you know, we've generally been visualizing it, looking at kind of accuracy versus SNR, which is what you have here, uh, and just a traditional confusion matrix, um, which shows you, you know, which classes are confused with which other ones. Um, all right, so the kind of reference implementation of this classifier now is, is available. So we put this up also on RadioML. Um, and so this is kind of an example of what Keras gives you. So um, in Keras, it's very easy to put together these very various neural net configs, um, you know, in this kind of very Pythonic uh, uh, syntax, right? And this is uh, very much, you know, it looks quite a bit like Guni Radio, where you're basically building a, uh, a uh, directed graph of these different layers, where each layer has a special transform and a set of parameters that get fit during a training function. Um, and so, if you look, so there's a there's an IPython notebook that's checked in there, um, which has the uh, this kind of reference classifier uh, that can be run against the data set. Um, all right, so. Getting all this stuff up is kind of a headache. Uh, so building Guinea Radio causes people enough trouble sometimes. Um, and on top of that, if you want to build CUDA, Keras, Theano, and TensorFlow, and a handful of out-of-tree modules, you know, that's quite an environment to get set up on your own sometimes, especially if you're kind of new to the field. Um, and so we have a kind of a Docker container up um, to help people get started. Um, and this is kind of the, the really quick way uh, to get started um, where you, there's already an environment that's been put together for you. Um, and one of the cool things is, so NVIDIA actually has this NVIDIA Docker uh, version, which allows you to do CUDA GPU offload from within a Docker container. Um, so you can actually get, you know, almost full, you know, bare metal speed uh, running out of this. Um, yeah, so this is an easy way to get started. Um, right, so there's a lot more uh, we want to do. Um, so uh, I think that this is a really, um, you know, young area. It's not really just kind of a hype word that's sitting around right now, even though people like to chuckle about deep learning. Um, but this is really is kind of a, a large change in how we do signal processing. Uh, and it has really changed image and voice uh, significantly. And it doesn't look like they're going back anytime soon. Um, and I think signal processing is really going the same way. So um, I feel like we really need to start embracing a lot of um, you know, machine learning centric ways of doing signal processing. Um, and so, you know, ModRec is really just a simple first task. Um, we'd like to expand the, you know, the scope of ModRec and also look at other tasks uh, that we can do. Um, you know, ultimately you can look at demodulation as an entire machine learning task, right? Um, right, and so Gnu Radio integration is really, really straightforward. Um, Keras is these nice, you know, Pythonic uh, definitions of algorithms that can really be just dropped right into Python blocks. Uh, and since you're passing around, uh, you know, C NumPy vectors, um, all that data never really makes it into Python. It's all kind of hidden behind Swig. So you can very efficiently integrate um, different types of machine learning algorithms directly into GNU Radio using Python blocks. Um, and um, yeah, so, so there's a lot of uh, tools that, you know, we're building and I think will be built in time in that area, um, including some of the GR inspector stuff that we've done this summer. Um, right, so just a really quick brief. So, um, you know, two of the ideas that I'm really excited about now and kind of pursuing heavily are, are really, you know, uh, attention models have been a big thing in, in machine learning. If you look at, uh, so Google in the Street View Challenge, uh, you have this idea of you have, you know, a 10,000 by 10,000 pixel giant image from their uh, Street View car. Um, and they're trying to re read digits, right? And so one of the things that's been very, very powerful is using an attention model with this kind of 2D affine transform to direct the attention in a high resolution image to start pulling out, you know, uh, a digit so that it can be classified. 
Uh, and now this is, this is really exciting because um, these spatial transformers um, basically are an end-to-end -end learned synchronization method. Um, and so I've started playing with these in comms as well. Uh, there's this paper, Learning to Synchronize, that's out there. Um, and really the idea is you can start to learn how to synchronize really naively uh, just by training an end-to-end -end attention and then discriminative system um, as kind of one. Um, and so I think that's a really exciting idea that's going to um, you know, help us start to build modems without having to even write synchronizers for them. Um, and then lastly, there's this learning to communicate. Um, and so the, the whole idea here is that, uh, you know, well, why do we pick QPSK and convolutional codes? Or why do we use these, these constructs that we've kind of thought of and used for a long time? You know, really all we want to do is transmit some bits and recover those bits on the other side of some wireless channel. Um, and so if we can basically just turn over the encoding and decoding process entirely to an optimized kind of parametric machine learning process, um, you know, we can start to learn entirely new modulations and coding uh, that just aren't uh, defined in an expert way anymore. Um, and so this is an example of, you know, what some of the learned basis functions for a very simple uh, channel autoencoder look like here. Um, and it, it's interesting because they, they look almost a little bit like what you might see in like a wavelet packet type of a modulation. Um, and so I think it's, you know, it's interesting to see, uh, you know, what emerges from these problems kind of naturally. Um, and the cool thing is we're getting, you know, bit error rate versus SNR that's really comparable with existing techniques and modulation. So that's it. Um, I'll open it up for questions. Um, but I'm really excited to, um, you know, keep pursuing this area. I think it's going to grow like crazy. Wonderful. Yeah, question, question men are running around. We have Raj. So, uh, got a question about the Docker container. I haven't pulled it down and tried it, but how, do you, how are you handling the CUDA drivers? Are they baked in, and are you allowed to redistribute them if so? So, um, NVIDIA actually distributes a uh, Ubuntu NVIDIA CUDA base layer Docker. Um, and so that's what we're using as the, the base. So uh, we start with the, the Docker that NVIDIA provides that already has all that in it, um, and then uh, build everything else on top of that as different layers. But uh, it pulls from their servers and everything, so. Nick. Hello. Um, do, you, do you see any, in terms of the learn, um, learning to communicate types behavior, um, have you seen anything that starts to mimic anything like error correction, whether in the radio stuff you've done or even examples in, you know, imaging and speech? Uh, yes. So, I mean, you can, you can definitely start to achieve, you know, error correction comparable with existing techniques. Um, and I'm still working on some work in that area that hopefully will be out soon. Um, but it seems like it's quite easy for small block sizes for it to learn codes. Um, both existing ones and new techniques. Um, you know, for much larger block codes, it becomes, you know, a more, um, a, a more difficult problem to search. So, um, is that true as well in terms of the, you know, the, the encoding side? Um, so I, I, I could easily understand how a, a learned method might be able to start decoding uh, and applying error correction, but I, I would be you know, happily shocked to, you know, see that it was actually picking up that behavior on the encoding side. Right. So actually, if you think about um, some of the regularization you would use in a normal, like, image ML process, um, you know, people use dropout, and they also use Gaussian noise, you know, additively just on a layer. Uh, and so uh, both of these effects mean that when a network is propagating information up um, you know, you have information lost where those activations are either dropped or added with large amplitude noise. Um, and so kind of naturally, that's this regularizing effect that, that forces the network to want to spread that information around across many different activations. Um, and so, you know, you really, you know, looking at that, you really already have this, this notion where when it's training, it wants to, you know, spread the information somehow across, you know, a representation that's, you know, robust to those types of impairments. Um, so, so yeah, I mean, it, it definitely, you know, has been able to learn encodings that, you know, are quite robust to, you know, a dropped bit or a dropped, you know, symbol or something. 
So we have time for more questions, but I'd like to ask the next speaker to start setting up his, his gear. Okay, we have one, actually two questions from there. Um, at the risk of sounding naive here, but I don't think I'm completely alone um, <laughs> in this subject, you know, what a convolutional layer does or a softmax layer or all these blocks, I, you know, I have no idea, but I'm, I'm really curious about the, this sort of new engineering process. Like, how did you, are these just classical structures you borrow from or like what's your process you go through to arrive at these different structures and you know, the whole synchronization, like what does that look like? So largely what I've done, at least for the classifier, is starting to look at, you know, what has worked in the image domain. Um, so you can look at even, so if you look at uh, the network we're using for Modrec, it's really basically just Jan LeCun's LayNet 5 that he used, you know, years ago for doing digit recognition. Um, but instead of, you know, this, these square patches, we have these highly, you know, they're, they're 2D, but it's like 2 by 128, right? So they're very long 2D patches. Um, so, I mean, I would say most of it is looking at imagery and trying to borrow a lot of ideas from what's worked for image recognition. Uh, and then a lot, you know, some of it is trial and error, and uh, there's different ways. You know, hyperparameter optimization is a big uh, area right now in machine learning and you know how do you find the optimal network structure and how do you tune it best um, and there's a lot of different approaches to that that people are looking at now I mean you can do kind of genetic algorithm approaches uh, some people have tried to make hyperparameters differentiable so you can try to um, do gradient descent there as well um, so there, and, and some of it is just trial and error so there's you know there's a lot of different ways you know to try to build and tune and adapt these um, it's, you know, that's kind of an op a big open problem at the moment. So we can have two more while you start switching out your laptops. Um, I can't remember which one who was first. Yeah, Richard. Hello. Uh, I was wondering for neural, neural networks, deep learning in general, uh, do these, do, does a radio exist, a real-time radio that uses techniques like that? Are we close to it existing or are we far away for a real-time system? Um, I think that it's not far away at all. Um, so training these can be very complex computationally, um, but when you actually have these networks trained, um, it's really just you know compact, dense matrix math, um, and so it can run very fast. And there's really no reason once you have trained one of these sorts of representations or classifiers that you can't run it in real time um, very efficiently. Uh, and, and a lot of this stuff, you know, backs up to the SGEM, uh, you know, matrix libraries. Um, and so, you know, that, that can run very fast on either a general purpose pro processor or a kind of a GPU um, to do real time sorts of things. Okay, final question. Um, getting back to the CUDA installation, you mentioned a dock, which I'm not familiar with, a docker. Does that actually manage to get the CUDA driver itself baked into Ubuntu for you, or is that a separate step you have to handle? Yeah, it does. So the only caveat is that, uh, so Docker is like a container that runs, it's like a lightweight VM kind of that runs uh, on your system. The only caveat is you do need the CUDA driver on your bare metal system, uh, and then you run NVIDIA Docker you know, to run the container with it, within that. Yeah, it, so, I was asking, so you do need to itself in manually? Um, within the container, it's baked in for you, uh -huh. but outside the container, you have to also install it somehow. Okay, okay. we're getting very specific, and I'd like to remind people that Friday is a good time to ask those questions at the, the hacker event. Okay, round of applause for Tim, please. Thanks.